In this video, I'm going to show you five simple circuits that will level up your electrician game and allow you to play at any level you desire to. We're going to be going over essential circuits that you legit cannot live without and I believe that every base needs. A RAID detection circuit is a simple circuit that uses a smart alarm to send a notification to your phone. It uses one electrical branch, one blocker, one smart alarm, and depending on how many detections you want to use, that's how many counters you would use. So if you wanted to detect four wall walls being exploded, you'd use four counters. To begin this circuit, you're going to need an E branch. Go ahead and put it down. Don't worry about the numbers. We'll figure out the values for that later. And then next, we're going to need to set down a blocker. After that, we need a smart alarm. Next, you're going to take the power out and run that to the power in on the blocker, and then run the blocker to the smart alarm. After this is done, we need to take some components that we're going to put on walls that we want to detect that have been broken. I like to personally use counters since they're cheap and also you can see the power as you pass through, which makes it easier to figure out the value for this E-branch. I set mine to 4 since I have 3 components with a power draw of 1 and then I need one more power to go through the block pass through on the blocker. So essentially your power demands for this circuit is going to be how many of these components that you want to see or how many of these components that you want to detect whenever they break. And so run those, the end of the chain to the block pass through, and then run power to your electrical branch. If everything is working, you should see your smart alarm turn on and then disable. And to make sure it is working or not, as soon as you delete one of these walls, you should see the smart alarm immediately turn on. Our auto smelting circuit is very simple and also turns itself on and on. You need one AND switch, one blocker, four power splitters, one electrical branch, nine electrical furnaces, ten storage adapters, and two conveyors. To start off, we're going to take our conveyors and put one on the top left, and we're going to put them upside down, and one on the top right of our one by one. And these are going to be our input and output respectively. Uh, we also need four splitters that we're going to place for our power delivery to the furnaces. We're also going to need a blocker and a branch under that blocker. Then lastly, you need an AND switch. We're going to set our E branch to 35. Not 34, I actually messed up there, it's going to be 35. And then we're going to send our branch out to our blocker and then run our blocker to our leftmost power splitter. Then we want to wire the three power splitters on the right to each of the power outputs on our first power splitter. Then take your power out and run that to your first conveyor. Go ahead and run the electrical pass through from your first conveyor to your other conveyor. And then next what we're going to do is take our filter fails off of both of our conveyors and we're going to run that to our hand switch. After that we're going to take the power out from our hand switch and run it to the blocker. Next we're going to set our filters which is going to be all of our ore. Uh, for this example, I set each of them to two, but normally on a vanilla server, you could do like five, five, two. That seems to keep up with it. But just make sure you put these values in the max. Next, we're going to take our power output, and we're just going to run that to our E branch, since that's the beginning of our power delivery. And then after this, it's time to set up the furnaces. And so you want to do this one row at a time. So you'll see I'll set my initial row, add the adapters, and then you want to make sure you do your piping. You want to take your output from your box, or your input conveyor technically, the furnace input conveyor, and you want to run that down to the first uh, furnace. Then go ahead and wire them up. And then also, I would do the electricity. You'll see that I kind of forgot to do it, and this is what'll happen. You'll, you'll end up forgetting and then having to redo it. But same thing with the button. You want to put your igniter down there. So you'll see I'm wiring that up. You, you really want to do this stuff in series with rows. Same thing with wiring these furnaces up. You're gonna see I mess up. I start putting these down. But you'll put down the first two on the second row, 
and then from your last row you want to go ahead and hook the piping up so put your adapters on then run that over because once you start packing this in you really can't reach that back row I was barely able to do the power delivery here you'll see on that back most row I should have done it before I put the second row down so you see I'm kind of like looking around getting it, getting the lay of the land but uh, this is pretty much the wiring process you're gonna rinse and repeat all this stuff so just take it one row at a time Once we get to our last furnace, we want to take the output and run it to our output conveyor. And then after that is literally just putting your box down where you're going to let these ores live. And so what you're going to do is you're going to put the unsmelted ores in this box and then all once they get smelted, they'll be put back into this box. So just wire it up and then turn it on. Uh, one big thing is going to be when you put your ore in there and the furnace hasn't been lit once, you need to hit that button to ignite them. So watch your and switch and as soon as you see a red light, that means that you can prime it. And once you've lit these furnaces, they're lit. That you don't have to do that again. It, what, what you're doing is just blocking power and then turning the power back on. But once the server restarts, you're always going to have to turn this sucker on for the first time per day. So like if you're on a daily restart server, then you're going to have to do it once a day. But after that, put your door on it and she's locked and loaded, ready to go. An auto light circuit is the simplest circuit we're going to be discussing today. It just uses one blocker, one solar panel, and however many lights you want to use. This basically just turn the, turns the lights off during the day. Okay, so in Rust, whenever you have lights in a base, all you're doing is sending power in, right? You usually have an electrical branch, it shoots off power, and then lights are on. There's no way to really turn them on and off during the day. So what we can do is put a blocker down where our power is going to our lights, wherever this is, however you have your setup going. So you can see I'm doing that right now. And then if we take a solar panel and go put it on top of the roof, and it doesn't have to be in the most optimal position to where it gets 20 power constantly. All it needs to do is just generate at least one power and you wanna make sure that it doesn't have any shadows on it. And as soon as that solar panel detects light, it'll go through and turn all your lights off because you're powering that blocker. And this is just a really good way to have an indication inside your base if it's day or nighttime. The Nikor is an amazing circuit that allows you to efficiently supply power to your base. It requires two OR switches, one power splitter, one memory cell, two electrical branches, one blocker, and then when you're doing your battery setup, we're going to be doing two large batteries. You need two large batteries. one splitter, and one combiner. To begin building a knee core, we need to place two electrical branches and a memory cell in, in an L-shaped pattern, just like we're doing right here. Next, we're gonna put a splitter down and our two OR switches, one on the bottom right and one in the top middle of the circuit. Lastly, we put down a blocker. Next, we're going to take our branch out from our bottom left E branch and put it to the memory cell and then run our power out to the next E branch. We want to run the E branch off of, or the branch out from our second E branch to the top of the power splitter and set that E branch to 4. Then we route the power out to our bottom right OR switch. Next, we take the inverted output of the memory cell and run it to the bottom right OR switch as well. After that, we take our output from our memory cell and run it to the top OR switch and run our blocker into the top OR switch as well. Next, we take power out 1 and put it to set, power out 2 to reset on the memory cell, and then we want to take the power out 3 and run that to the block pass through on the blocker. The next step is to put our large battery down. I would not recommend building a knee core with medium batteries or car batteries since it's kind of overpowered, but run the power out from your OR switch to the power input of the battery and connect your power output to the blocker. Next, we're putting some counters here just so we can visualize the actual power flow going through this knee core. And you'll see right now it has 98, which means the battery is powering. 
The last step is to put our power generation into the bottom left uh, E branch, and we're going to set it to 12 to simulate 10 power as our power demand. And so you'll see right now the battery is getting around 87 power, and it's the battery is charging and is not being used at all. Next, the next step, if you want to, because sometimes you have more than 100 as your total power demand, or 98. So we want to put two batteries down. So then we can have 198 as our max power flow. So what you're going to do is put down a combiner and a splitter and route your outputs to the combiner and route both of the inputs to the splitter. This is going to evenly split the power between the two batteries and then combine them together for the 200. Route the splitter to your OR switch and the combiner to your blocker. And this basically hooks up two batteries that run in parallel. The charging is split between them, so they both charge at the same rate, but whenever they get used, it'll send the full 198 power. So try not to use two batteries unless you actually need that power demand, since you'll always be sending 198. Next, as another common question I'm asked, they say how do we add more batteries, and if you need more than two batteries, this is how you would hook up four batteries. And so again, we're just going to build another little battery bank with a combiner and a splitter. Now we're just going to put down another splitter and combiner and then basically just duplicate what we've done with the batteries. So we're going to take from this splitter and connect the other two splitters so all the power coming in is divided evenly between the batteries. And then we're going to add both of those root combiners on the battery banks to that battery bank. And this is essentially how you hook up four. If you want to do eight, you just kind of, you build these four, combine them all up, split them all up, and then just take the output and inputs and run them back to the knee core. Now keep in mind, this is not going to extend how long your, bat your base will survive without power generation. Your base will only last four hours at max charge, but this will allow you to send more power through your base. A battery backup circuit is used to have a second set of batteries in case your first set of batteries gets destroyed. You need four large batteries, three splitters, one OR switch, two combiners, one blocker, and one E branch. Okay, so in this example, we have two battery banks. And the first one, we only want powered on until it runs out, and then the second battery bank is allowed to be turned on. So what you're going to do is add a blocker to the, your backup battery bank, and you're going to add an E-branch to your primary battery bank. We don't need that E-branch up there. We're going to remove it. Then what you're going to do is you're going to put an OR switch at the end of your battery banks, and you're going to connect your power out from your E-branch to the OR switch, and you're going to connect your blocker power out to the OR switch. Then you're gonna take the branch out from the E-branch and send that to the blocker. And what this does is as long as those primary batteries have power, they're always going to block your second battery bank. And so what we're gonna do here is basically center power generation just like we do in the previous example when we built the knee core and all of our batteries are being powered. But if we were to spike this up to 400, you'll see that our first battery bank is actually eating the demand. So we're sending it, we're obviously not able to meet that power demand, also put 400 in that branch so it would actually pull it, and it's cruising through that first battery bank. But the second battery bank is still charging while that's going on, and it's going to be ready as soon as the first battery bank dies to pick up the load. Thank you for watching my video if you made it this far. Please make sure to like and subscribe. If you'd like to see how to break past the 12 turret limit, please check out my last video. Also, check out my Discord. Thank you again for watching and have a good one. Bye.